नन्ने मुन्ने बच्चे तेरी मुट्ठी में क्या है नन्ने मुन्ने बच्चे तेरी मुट्ठी में क्या है भाली मत वाली आंखों में क्या है भोली भाली मत वाली आंखों में क्या है बच्चे तेरी मुट्ठी में क्या है नन्हे मुन्ने बच्चे तेरी मुट्ठी में क्या है में जो मोती मिले लोगे या ना लोगे जिंदगी के आंसू का बोलो क्या करोगे ठीक में जो हेलो एवरीवन टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अ डायलॉग विद जेरू बिलिमोरिया जेरू इज अ सोशल एंटरप्रेन्योर एंड अ फाउंडर ऑफ सेवरल एनजीओस हर फर्स्ट एनजीओ चाइल्ड लाइन 1098 वाज इंस्पायर्ड by observing the needs of children in the streets of mumbai she has also created a ngo aflatun to help children of the streets manage their finances today aflatun is not limited to children of the streets it's used by children of all age groups and all social strata her enthusiasm brings organizations together she forms communities she creates ngos nurtures them grows them and let them be on their own so let's talk to jero so hello jero uh, it's nice to meet you uh, and i'm glad that we had a little conversation while you were on the train so that we we got to uh, understand each other a little bit um i though i won't be just set this conversation up with uh, by explaining my curiosity for talking to you um <clears throat> so as i mentioned to you during our talk i call myself an ethnographer of imagination and my curiosity is always about people who explore possibilities for creative solutions for pressing problems in the world and they solve them not just by themselves but bring people together uh in a collective energy collective purpose and set in place an organization and tools to do it sustainably and that's my curiosity and i read about you i watched some of your videos and of course jacob talked to me neelam talked to me about you and that's why my curiosity is about just seeing your journey hearing your stories and listening to what are the people places and events and ideas that have inspired you so that's the background i want to start with a fun question to you um because i do consider play is a very important part of life and i want to start with a little playful question if you were to relate yourself to a non human species like animal bird insect fish whatever which uh what comes to your mind a flower very interesting tell me more now because you bloom you give joy to everybody when you are blooming and then you die so beautiful and that's like you know this is something very interesting uh i really really love it uh, i want to build on that and what role does a bee play uh and do you can you picture people in your life that you would consider bees 
a bee cross pollinates. Yes. Um, yeah, I have lots of people in my life who have been very instrumental. Yeah. Wonderful. Because I think knowing whatever I've learned about you, you are not a giver, you are an enabler just by being who you are. You attract bees and they cross pollinate and you are not the only one pollinating. You let your pollens be borrowed and carried to other places from flower to flower and into the beehive and a, a whole new world gets created and honey gets created. So this was a beautiful metaphor and I'm, I'm not surprised that you didn't take any time to like not pick any of my examples and you created with your own. Sorry. Oh no, why sorry? This is what this whole conversation is about. We take leaps of, you know, imagination and that's what comes to my next part is about imagination. Um, as a child, did you dream a lot? No. Did you read stories? Yeah. Amar Chitra Kathas, yeah. Which was your uh, favorite character? I didn't have a favorite character. Sorry. You were just curious about everything. Yeah. So where did where does where do where do you think the seeds of who you are? or who you have been. I don't think you can be captured in who you are in one moment. You are an evolving person. Where, where did Everyone this... is. Yes. Uh, though I can see from your story that you don't let time stop you into one set of being. You're always evolving much faster and expanding much faster uh, than many people I have met. And I admire that about you. So where did this mindset come from? What do you attribute it to? My parents. What did they do? They were amazing. Tell me more. My father was an accountant, but he helped everybody around him. Mm -hmm. My mother was a social worker, so she took me to the slums with her. Mm -hmm. Both instilled a very strong sense of duty. Mm -hmm. So, I think I am who I am because of them. Then my brother, who is also very much influences me, his sense of basic caring. My husband, who is my everything, you know, and he's the yin to my yang and he calms me so multitude of friends and I think I'm truly blessed I'm very lucky I like the word caring that you uh, attributed to your brother right yeah <clears throat> and I have a hypothesis that I think the only way to build a future here onwards is by I have my three principles caring sharing and co-creating I think we need to live everything, the burden of history, the burden of biases, burden of knowledge, everything behind and be open-minded and curious and care, share and co-create. Mm. So that's my hypothesis. I don't know how, if you would agree with that. My hypothesis is enjoy life, go with the flow. I love that. Wonderful. So, so uh, moving forward in your life, so, so what was like, was there a turning point that like brought you in a moment of epiphany or, oh, why, this is what I want to do? No, no, no. I am a product of good indoctrination by parents. Good indoctrination by parents. So, so they, uh, they groomed you into what you are. So you, you don't think you are a part of your curiosity or consciousness? You think you were just grilled into being who you are? Yeah. And I saw my father died when I was a teenager. And I saw very clearly how when he had what he had done and how much he meant to the people whom he helped. Because when he died, 
all the people who lived on the pavement wanted to say goodbye because he had helped all of them. So I it's think for me that was a prof profound thing on what they had always said, sort of, it, you know, yeah. So tell me a little more, how does an accountant help people in the pavement? Because he was the most caring person I knew and he believed that life should be about sharing and giving. So did he help through his skills as an accountant or skills as a human? Skills as a human. Can you give me examples of what he may have done that people were so appreciative and caring? I think them? for one, he always used to listen. He used to have a kind word for everybody. When they needed money, they would come to him. He was just amazingly kind and wonderful. And my mom is one of the smartest people I know in the whole world. So she gave me my very theoretical connecting the dots, uh, you know. And you said she was a social worker. So was she like an evolved social worker or a trained social worker? Like did she go to a school like TISS? She was a graduate from TISS. And then she did her second master's in the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. and so she's really one of those firebrand women. So, uh, uh, and is she still there? No, she died just before COVID. And uh, how old would she have been if she was alive today? 95. So she was around my mother's age. Uh, my mother would have been 95 uh, if she was alive today. So, so I think she's a elder generation to Medha Patkar because Medha went to TISS also. Oh, my, my mom taught Medha. Oh, she did? Yeah, yeah. My mom was earlier. She was teaching. So she studied at Tata Institute. Then she worked in rural India. Then she went abroad. She did her second master's same time as Armaiti, then she came back, then she did a lot of work. And then towards the latter part, she was in Tata Institute. So as far as I know, she either taught Medha or her husband or whatever. Yeah, she right. taught a lot of students. And yeah. I, if I remember right, you also taught at TISS for a yeah. while, right? Yeah, yeah. I told you I was fully indoctrinated by my family to do duty. We were not rich, but we were middle class, upper middle class. So it was like, we have enough money, now we should help. So That's beautiful. And how did you discover? I'm a Parsi. That's part I, of our DNA. I, I, I know. I, I have so many Parsi friends. And you said, have fun. That's like a basic characteristic of Parsis. Uh, exactly. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I sent you the link to my videos. But I have done uh, a dialogue with Dadi Padamji. I don't know if you know him. He is a he's one of the foremost puppeteers of India, and I have done uh, a dialogue with Shirin Gandhi. I don't know if you know her. Uh, so she, bad. She has an art gallery. It used to be called Kemold Gallery. They used to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Her dad Keku Gandhi used to be running that in the past. Yeah, does she still run Chemold? Uh, well, it's now called Prescott Chemold uh, Gallery. And they moved from Jahangirat Gallery to uh, another location. But yes, yeah, she still runs it. And now her daughter helps her also. So I, loved, I loved it. I used to go to Jahangirat Gallery to see their exhibitions very often. Yes. So so and I do go to the restaurant over there, Samovar. Yes, I, I, that used to be a great place to go and eat some nice snacks there also. So wonderful. So, so I do have an appreciation for the Parsi DNA. <laughs> <laughs> See, the first thing I think about is the restaurant. Yes, wonderful. So coming back to this now, so when did your interest in children uh, develop? Because you could, as a social worker, you could focus on any problem, but consistently you worked uh, for the cause of children. No longer. Hmm. No longer. I work on all issues now. But um, I think it was more because I was working with street kids and street kids are the most fascinating in the world. I think from there. No other reason. 
So what were you doing with street kids that got you deeper into thinking about, say, child line? Uh, well, I was teaching at Tata Institute and I was having students placed there and that's how it started. Oh, so you would actually have your students go and talk to street children, kids? So did I. I volunteered at Shelter Don Bosco. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, how did that influence? How did your first idea for child line come in? I can't remember. I used to do something similar with homeless men in America mm -hmm. where I would help them find shelter in the night. But a lot of it was done by phone. And therefore, I thought maybe if we have a phone service for kids. And my street kids always used to say, you social workers are only there at home nine to five, but we need you in the night. And I think, therefore, how could you reach out and help them in the night and then the phone? And they used to call my house all the time. So I take no credit for the idea. It's the kids who... It's always that way, right? When you keep your mind open, you get ideas from you never know where. So Absolutely. this is interesting. Uh, I, I, I also teach at Carnegie Mellon University here in uh, the Bay Area. And one of the exercises I do them is I ask my class to put post-it notes of if you were to creating a wayfinding app for homeless people, what are their needs that you would want to address? And they would come up with a set of needs that they think they have. And then I run a video that has been done by a social organization, talks about a day in a life of a homeless person. And it throws out things like they go and sit in the library and read books there because that's one place where you know they can spend time. They're looking for jobs. They're uh, all kinds of things that what I think what they want to do is what they want to use their time effectively. And suddenly it opens up a completely different mental frame for the children. Um, not children, but students. And so I can completely relate to the fact that working with homeless people in the U.S. gave you some kind of a direction into creating this. Yeah. Now, child, child line developed in Mumbai, correct? Mm -hmm. Then it got national and then it got international also. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me a little bit about its progression. Like, is it still there? Yeah. And it's then, 600 so, districts. 300 districts. 600. 600 districts. 642. Okay. And currently and what, we are in the process of transitioning it to the government. And uh, does government still fund it? Yeah, we are transitioning the whole program to the government. Okay, and we, that would be... And it funded it. Uh, last year, the budget was 242 crores. Wow. And how many children benefit from it? I think 10 million calls a year. Wow. And I, I've seen some of the uh, presentations of uh, Childline. But, but, but what are the, like, the most commonly uh, asked for... Like, what kind of problems do they ask help for on this child depends, life? Depends, depends. But it's uh, rescuing a child laborer, domestic child labor abuse, family abuse, incest, study stress, uh, depression, sponsorship, street kids with beaten by the police, harassment, health. It's a whole range of issues. And, family uh, violence. And... Are the, are the kind of calls you get, are they primarily from certain strata of the society or from all kinds of? Initially, they were mainly from street children, but now it's across the board. So are schools and colleges making children aware of this high helpline? Uh, I haven't been associated with Childline now officially for the past seven or ten, nine, ten years, I think. So you because just... my whole thing is to start, scale, and uh, look. So I cannot give you the details. I am mm -hmm. sorry. No worries. Uh, but as far as I know, 1098 has got a lot of publicity and is also in many textbooks. Mm -hmm. Then you also created an organization for helping children 
manage their financial well-being. Yeah, aflatun, yeah. Aflatun. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is? Aflatun basically is <clears throat> about social and financial education and it emerged from my learnings from street kids and then we had another program called Mail Joel where we used to get children from private and municipal schools to interact but the children from the municipal schools very often or from the rural schools never had any money to even want to, to come for a picnic or anything. So it's very easy to teach things if they don't have basic. So we said we needed to teach children about money. And similarly, street kids, they would be drag picking. They would earn a lot of money, but they never learned how to save. So they would blow it all up. So teaching them the culture of saving was what we started and that evolved into a total financial education curriculum. So it was a mix of two of my programs from where the idea came again from the kids and their needs. Again, borrowing from my experience of changing the mental frameworks of my students about homeless people, it almost seems like when you told me that rag pickers make a lot of money but they don't know how to manage their finances, Tell me a little bit about what do you mean by they make a lot of money? I just don't have a mental model of street kids having financial resources to get into a discipline of saving. If you went rag picking hmm. or they did wadi work, you would get paid. So uh, rag picking is, you know, they'd collect bottles, this, that, they'd go and sell it. They'd get 20, 30, 40 euros sometimes rupees, I mean, and uh, by the end of the day, they would have spent it off. Now, because if they are living in a shelter, they can actually save the money. The food wouldn't be at that time more than 10 rupees. So they could save even if they save a little bit, but that was not the mindset. So teaching them how to getting a trade, moving them, that was the basic thing. So how is their financial reality different from an average middle class person's financial reality because I think middle class people kind of have a mental framework of saving uh, but so what, how, how is it different because they, one would always so think, of I, the, think every, <coughs> I think every person is different and your reality comes with what you have been taught so I think it's not right to say one has it and one doesn't have it Mm -hmm. I think what's right to say is that everyone has a different reality and a different upbringing. And if you have a, a financial education is a learned skill, if it is not taught by your family, you're either taught it by your family, you're taught it by whoever. And sometimes it's just part of who you are. You know, some people just love to spend you know, and however much you can teach them, they don't really learn. So I think it's the inherent complex of who you are, how you spend, what you save, all of that. You and know. I, this is just a curious question. Do you teach them to save or do you also teach them to save and invest so that their money can grow? Um, we, I think financial education goes beyond saving. We talk about social and financial education in Aflatun. That means it starts with believing in yourself because that is the most important change that you have to do. So we have five core elements and it's believing in yourself, believing in others, believing that you can have change. Then when you're saving, we don't talk only about saving money. It's a mental construct when people think that, but it is about saving resources, gas, water, electricity, not killing things. So it's a whole saving the ecosystem is what we always say. It's about then starting your own enterprises if you can. So the micro entrepreneurship, it's about planning, it's about budgeting. So social and financial education starts with you as a person thinking about yourself within your environment. And that's what Aflatun is about. Wonderful. So what I'm seeing is my interpretation of what you just said is that you're moving their uh, mindset from either deficit or consumption oriented thinking to conservation and growth oriented thinking. Would that be fair to say? 
partially because the true thing only comes when you believe in yourself and your inner goodness. Correct. And that inner goodness and how it relates to the world. So the, if they, if people participate in Aflatun, do their social relationships change? In some cases, yes. And their understanding of society around them changes. If I speak for my own son, uh, I, when he was young, I always used to say, you know, there's a flatoon in you. He's your friend. Uh, you know, he was a boy. So, you know, and that's the inner light in you. So I used to always make up stories around that for my son and my daughter, but more my son because he was younger and, you know, boys. and. So uh, before I ask you a question, I'll give you my instant reaction to the word aflatun. To me, aflatun means magic. I don't know what did you have in mind. Well, it wasn't a word I chose. It was a word which was chosen by kids. At that time, there was a Bollywood film which was famous called Aflatun Mainu, Aflatun some song. I don't know. Kiss a number of Baikaru, telephone. Till the metal ash, there is a page of noon. Afala, 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 Afalatun. Afalatun. Mainu, Afalatun. So they chose it. So I followed the kids. And later I learned Aflatun as Plato and Arabic. So I think Uday, where you and I will differ is my whole life is about listening to the people I'm working with mm -hmm. and trying to take that forward and making that happen. And I think that's something which is very, very important because we are a part of our environment. And I completely understand. And I'm, I'm learning something that is at the core of your belief system. And I will give you one interesting example. Two years ago, I wrote a children's book. Uh, and my theme was finding your inner child. And I invited a whole group of my friend's children from seven-year-old to 12-year-old to draw a sketch of the character they have in mind in their imagination when they're talking to that character when they are distressed, unhappy, angry, upset, confused, whatever. And about 15 children drew a sketch and I took that sketch and turned it into a cartoon character and my whole book was created around that. So I absolutely understand what you're saying, that your whole approach is listening to people. I, I'm, I'm loving it. So... Um, so how do you feel that like you started in India and now you are global? Like I was you were reading some material on the internet where it said your, the organizations and communities you created are in multiple countries, right? How many would you say? Depends on the organization. Which organization has the maximum network of? I think... Uh... I don't know the latest numbers, but all of them are 100 plus. Wow. And uh, which I know you created many organizations. You like to like get people to create something, nurture it and pass it on, like let it be. How many have you created? Depends. Eight, nine. Depends how you count. And now you said you are not limited to children only. So what's your latest venture? Catalyst 2030, when Neelam and Jacob are part of it. Mm -hmm. And that's a network of social entrepreneurs for social entrepreneurs by social entrepreneurs, where we are moving to create a sector. And what, what, I remember he said uh, it was in New York that it was formed and he was doing some graphical note taking for that. Yeah. So, tell me Even more before about that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that initiative, please. Catalyst 2030 is a network, as I said, for social entrepreneurs, by social entrepreneurs. It started as a WhatsApp group where many of us felt that individually we could do so much, but collectively we can do so much more. So mm -hmm. it's about believing in the power of the collective to bring about change. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have like a mission? Our mission is that if we work collectively, we can achieve the SDGs. 
and uh, and so you take each one's own uh, area of work and support each other regardless of having a cumulative vision of what the future looks like or do you yes. have a vision of what the world looks like in your collective imagination well, for me, I'll speak for myself. And I think our whole collective imagination is that the people and planet are happy, healthy, prosperous. You know, my, yeah, my whole thing is everyone's happy. And, you know, we have an India Roti Kapra Makan. Nice. So making people happy is your mission, your vision and your imagination. My personal, yeah. Yeah. And, and do you, like... Have you ever like tried to write it down or you've kept it as simple as that? No, I keep it as simple. My life is about making life simple. I like that. What, what, what place does humor have in that future? I told you life is about enjoying. Humor is part of enjoyment. Enjoyment do, is humor. Do you, do you bring humor into uh, the engagements that you create? Like, How do you do that? I don't think about it but everything has a joke so you know yeah. enjoy it I like it the reason I ask is like when I like open turn on TV or I read newspapers or whatever there is so much there is so much more lack of humor in everything the way people talk to each other people talk about issues everything Laughter is the best medicine, I always say. So you must always have something to laugh about. Yeah, but can, can what do you laugh about when you see like right now what's happening in the media? You see like wars and hatred and stuff like that, killing. How, how do you sustain your ability to laugh and uh, take life joyfully? Because I'm grateful for what I have. So if you're grateful, then you find humor in everything. And my husband has a fantastic sense of humor. Mm. And so do my children. So there's always something to laugh at the dinner table. Have you ever been to Bhutan? No. Because I was wondering, because when you said your mission is to be happy, I just remembered Bhutan because they don't think about GDP. They think about like happiness index, right? Hmm. Has that idea yeah. ever like touched your mind? No, I've read about it, but I haven't been to Bhutan, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So are you fully dedicated to this project that we just talked about? Or like, are you, you are like scouting for the next project also? For now, this project takes up a long work day. So yes, currently I'm on it. And is it all online communication or are you do, like you're in Amsterdam? Do you have a local community which is participating in this also? A lot of this is online just now. A lot of this is online. Uh, so are you still involved in doing things in person or have you moved to a lot more of your work managing it remotely? All of it is remote. So that takes me to another thing which I am questioning. And I would seek your advice on that because a lot of my work is dialogue, listening, observing, and being present with people to listen to them, to give a caring ear to them. I have, especially through the COVID times when I had to do everything remotely, I have been questioning whether there is there still a place for in person in presence kind of an interaction or are we just moving towards being effective remote remotely i think you need both mm -hmm. yeah that's all i can say that's fair so i i'm assuming that there are people in your network who are still reaching out to real people in the real world, talking, listening to them, being with them. Yes. Can, can you feel uh, uh, cared for through an online conversation with people? 
there are many people who are friends whom I've never met in person. Did COVID time have any impact on your understanding of communication? Nah. I always used to talk a lot on the phone. So you forget I started a helpline. You don't always meet people. That's true. So I so I think you have what I'm also learning is that you have perfected the art of remote communication. I don't know whether I've perfected it or not, but I'm fine with it. I understand. You know? So if like now the the purpose of my this video mm -hmm. is uh, to create an archive of insight and inspiration for the next three generations. So it, it's not just about commenting on what the world it is now, the problems it has and solutions it needs, mm -hmm. but, but the thoughts, because I think I'm taking the post-independence era where so many amazing people have inspired other people to be just good, live life meaningfully, joyfully mm -hmm. uh, and transmit that to the next generation like your parents did mm. so what would what would you want like from your work and through our dialogue what would you want the third generation from now to remember about the energy and the ideas and the culture that you are trying to create I think I was brought up on three Zora on a Zoroastrian principle of good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Don't harm anybody and enjoy life. And I think that's what I live by, simple. That is so interesting that when I had a dialogue with Dadi, Dadi said exactly the same thing. That's very much part of Zoroastrianism and that's the essence we are a small religion. That's the essence of our religion. Yeah. And it's so appealing, even whether you're a Zoroastrian or not. It's such simple truth. It's like something that every mom and dad should tell to their child or probably aren't already telling to their kids. Do you think so? How, do, you, do you think the world is listening to these simple ideas? I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Do you have hope for the future? I live in hope. What gives you hope? My family, my friends, the world around, the genuine everyday acts of kindness that I see. Jeru, I must say something, some, something that I'm feeling amazing and beautiful. Unlike any ideologues or philosophers that I've read or met or are like revolutionaries, you make things so simple and easy to, to internalize and to like not let the chaos get into your body. Like listening to you, it feels, hey, if you just follow these simple things, life is beautiful. I think it is. Wonderful. This is this is fantastic. I don't want to stretch this out a lot. I'm learning so much from your simple philosophy of life. So imagine you are right now addressing a third generation when you are not even here on this earth. Can you just say something to them? Enjoy yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. Follow the principles of good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And keep helping everybody around you. Thank you so much, Jeru. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I know that you know that these kind of just simple conversations are more inspiring than any profound thoughts. Thank you. Thank you thank very much. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. हाल सुनने दिल वाला
दिल का हाल सुनने दिल वाला सिर्फ इस बात न मिर्च मसाला कह के रहेगा कहने वाला दिल का हाल सुनने दिल वाला अज दिल का हाल सुनने दिल वाला सिर्फ इस बात न मिर्च मसाला कह के रहेगा कहने